So, uh, well, thank you to the organisers. I didn't really know what I was letting myself in for coming here. I have to say it's been incredibly informative. And um, so I um, work at, say, at the Institute of Cancer Research, which, for those of you who don't know, it is next to the Cancer Hospital, the Royal Marsden in London. Um, I'm not a clinician. Um, I run a lab um, focusing on the biology of advanced breast cancer and particularly um, tumor stroma interactions. So when I was asked to th give this talk, um, I thought, well, you know, this will be very interesting. And I think you've already heard this from other speakers. Um, there's just very little preclinical data out there. So I was a bit stumped, you know, when I started to prepare it. Um, so first of all, I've got no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, so I thought, well, you know, what do we want? What do you want, um, you know, out of the preclinical stuff? I mean, hopefully more information on mechanisms of action, the opportunity to test hypotheses. Um, and I think importantly, as we've heard, you know, can the preclinical um, help in the development of assays or biomarkers for making decisions such as whether you, you can, I was going to say de-escalate, but I gather we're meant to say optimize <laughs> uh, therapies now. Um, and the, perhaps a, a very important issue about, you know, what information it can provide on um, you know, toxicities. So I'm going to focus uh, what I'm talking about. Really, I thought I'd look at the HER2 um, targeted therapies, and if there's time, a little bit about the PARP inhibitors. So, um, it's uh, 2023, and when I was looking back at this, as far as I can work out, the first of the data saying that there could be some synergies between HER2 targeted therapies and, um, and radiotherapy actually was 25 years ago. And this was the first um, publication I could come across from um, scientists at Penn. And in this case, what they did is they took the, it's a, uh, uh, glioma cell line, the U U37 MG cell, which is a HER2 overexpressing cell line. Um, and what they did is they expressed in that cell line a truncated form of HER2. So it, it, this inhibits the HER2 signaling because you dimerize, but you can't do the signaling. And what they showed is that these, um, you know, when you inhibit the HER2 signaling, the cells were much more responsive to radiotherapy in terms of, more, you know, more cells were killed by the radiotherapy. And this is the only data they show. This is, you know, and this was, um, you know, but this stood the test of time. So, um, and, and you can see it both in the, you know, DAPI staining, but also just in the apoptosis. They then actually, a, a sort of year later, followed this up with using an inhibitory um, antibody. Now, it's, what it was was an inhibitory peptide made from the 4D5 antibody. And the 4D5 antibody is the antibody that was then humanized to make trastuzumab. And what they showed here, again, was that um, if you um, add this peptide um, and then wait 24 hours and then give the 10 gray dose, that you can see that the, the, there's a lot more killing with the uh, targeting peptide than with a control peptide. And they also made a bit of a deal about the fact that you, you wait this 24 hours. And this comes back to the question about sequencing with some of these uh, drugs. Um, almost at the same time, just a few months later, um, this paper came out in Cancer Research. Um, and they took the, a different approach. They overexpressed HER2 in the MCF7 ER positive, originally HER2 negative cell line. Um, and treated that with or without the 4D5 antibody. So this is the, you know, the precursor, say, to Herceptin or Betrastuzumab, um, and showed that, the, again, the, the, um, with the her, the, in the HER2 overexpressing cell lines, if you add the antibody, um, then you got more killing, um, at, you know, with the, and they titrated in the radiation dose here. And they also did exactly the same thing, this time with a naturally uh, HER2 amplified cell line, the SKBR3. So again, quite an impressive difference in killing with the, um, you know, you can see there's some effect of the HER2 antibody alone, um, but that's, um, but a lot with the radiotherapy. Now, in all of these experiments, there's all sorts of controls missing, you know, like no radiotherapy control cell lines. But, and this was really the start of, of, of this, um, and, you know, the, there was a thing that this wasn't just an additive effect, this was a synergistic effect. Um, the same group also in the same paper, they also went on, and I've 
um, showed this very impressive animal experiment where they, again, just used these, um, her two um, overexpressing MCF7 cells, uh, treated them, and now we have got some um, controls here. They treat them without anything, with the antibody alone, with um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, radiotherapy alone. Interesting, none of those had any effect, and that's a little bit sort of curious, but the combination that sort of flatlined out. Um, so that was the first, as far as I can work out, sort of in vivo experiment showing that there might be um, a, a synergy between the two. And they also showed this very interesting piece of data, which well, it is interesting to me, where they show that um, in these cell lines, so they've got parental MCF7s, the controls, the overexpressing, and then a naturally HER2 positive cell line. That, um, and now they're measuring DNA repair in these cell lines. So if you add the antibody, nothing. It doesn't do anything alone. The no increase in DNA repair. Um, if, if, you treat, if you irradiate the cells, then there's a sort of massive spike, as you expect, of DNA repair. Um, but the, this targeting antibody in the overexpressing cell lines and the SKBL3 cell lines, you get this reduction in DNA repair when you put the blocking antibodies in. Um, and so, you know, why is this happening? So, um, you're the, you're the um, clinical oncologist here, so you all know how radi radiotherapy works, obviously DNA damage, and of course if you damage the DNA, the first thing the cell's going to do is, is start to upregulate all its DNA repair mechanisms. It's a little murkier on the HER2 side, so HER2 signaling is also supposed to sort of promote DNA repair quite how and why, I think, is, is um, uh, um, not at all clear in the literature. But of course, if you block that, then you're going to uh, reduce the amount of DNA repair. And if you reduce the amount of DNA, you're going to have lots of unresolved damage. And eventually, that will drive the cells into uh, apoptosis. So that's the early stuff. So what's really happened since then? Um, and I think one of the big questions when thinking about how to targeting, and I I confess, um, I thought this was going to be a simple question. How does Herceptin or Trastuzumab work? It's just, again, it's a complete mess out there in the literature. Um, so what we do know is that um, the humanized version of the antibody, so the Trastuzumab, is that there is an ADC effect. So the um, antibody, when it's bound to the target cell, will recruit via its FC receptor um, cytotoxic T cells, and that will induce some killing of the HER2 positive cells. How the antibody itself blocks HER2 signaling, or whether it's driving receptor internalization and you just get degradation of the HER2 or shedding of the HER2 off the cell surface, there's, or, um, in, you know, or driving a different signaling pathway, the literature's all over the place, so I won't go through that. But one thing I think that um, we do know now is that um, if, you, if you block the signaling, um, and this is now using small molecule inhibitors, not the targeting antibodies, um, you can get the same uh, um, effect in, in terms of um, synergizing with radiotherapy. So there's, in this case, quite nice, they've got two models. Um, um, again, that SKBR3 um, uh, cells there, they've implanted them into mice, treated them with antibody alone, uh, sorry, this, the small molecule inhibitor, the parat uh, paratinib, which is a, one of these irreverse, newer irreversible um, um, in, uh, kinase inhibitors. Um, that has some effect, the radiation alone has some effect, but the combination is much more effective. So this tells us, at least from my reading of it, so that it's, you know, this, it's not all an ADC effect. And of course, this is in immunocompromised mice, so you won't see any ADC effect because you're in, um, you know, you're in an immune um, uh, deficient mice. But the, the, certainly the kinase inhibitors tell you that there's something to do with the HER2 signaling alone um, that can synergize with um, radiotherapy. But it's, uh, it's not really addressing the ADC function. So um, then I just thought I'd go through a couple of n newer publications, both from the, um, Sarat, Sarat, I don't know how you pronounce it, Sarasi lab, 
Um, and this one um, actually asks a couple of interesting questions. And I think that's, we've heard this, you know, in the talks yesterday about, um, you know, d d when using these things in combination is an opportunity re to reduce doses. And this one's asking, first of all, about, you know, if you don't put in as much of the trastuzumab. And so what they do is they take a, um, some HER2 positive cell lines and they actually show it in, in a number of different models. Um, and this is very low dose trastuzumab. So if you add the trastuzumab and, um, and it's a measure of cell death. So if you add the trastuzumab on its own, it's having a small effect, but not very much. Um, if they fractionate the radiotherapy, it's again having some effect, but not as much as um, a, a single, a six gray dose. But when you do the two together, um, you, you get this, um, um, then the fractionated dose is the same as the single dose. And I think, you know, again, this is sort of pointing in the direction of trying to do, you know, this is where perhaps the preclinical studies can start to, you know, add some uh, um, Im useful information by looking at these different dosing schedules. Um, and nicely, they also then show, again, with a relatively low dose of the trastuzumab in, in two animal models um, with fractionated, or oh, three doses of radiotherapy, um, um, and again, the uh, trastuzumab added a little bit before the radiotherapy, that they're getting um, an, a nice um, synergistic effect of, of combining the two. So th there were two, they published two papers fairly close together. Um, this was the first one of, of looking at the tras, more looking at the trastuzumab uh, dose. Oh, sorry, and I think this was a, a, one other really nice thing in this paper, is they also looked at the hypoxic status of the tumours with these different treatments. And um, I, I hope you can see that um, in the, in, again, in, actually they did it in three models, but in these two, two models shown here, you can see that the trastuzumab alone, even though it's a relatively low dose and it's not having a massive effect on the tumour size, it's making the tumour uh, much less hypoxic. And, uh, you know, as you know, there's the dogma that um, radiotherapy is not as effective in the hypoxic environment. So another way that these two might be uh, mechanistic, mystic, you know, mechanism by which they might be synergizing. So I thought this was actually, you know, one of the very nice parts of the preclinical data. So in their second paper, they, they asked about different doses of... Um, of radiotherapy and the combination. What happens if you add the trastuzumab first or the radiotherapy? And they did different um, timing schedules. And I've sort of grouped together the results so you can see the control. Then there's all the different doses of trastuzumab and there's a little bit of difference if you, um, uh, uh, on, depending on how much you're adding. Um, then there's the, um, um, the, the, the radiotherapy alone, and the trouble is with this experiment, is the radiotherapy alone is pretty effective. And underneath that, you can see this little group of lines, and this is adding the radiotherapy first or adding the trastuzumab first. So although it's saying it doesn't matter what order you add them in, the problem is the radiotherapy itself is having a very large effect. Um, the second thing, but, you know, still, this is, you know, asking the right sort of question, I think. They also asked about, you know, the, the doses of the radiotherapy. So now they're going back to single doses. And I think they, again, because they're, they're good at using, um, in this case, they've got um, uh, two models, you know, HER2 negative and a HER2 positive, um, showing that if you add the five gray radiotherapy, it's not quite as effective as a single dose as the 10 gray. But when you add the five gray with the um, trastuzumab, then it's just as good as adding Tengre in the trastuzumab. So again, you know, sort of hinting towards this, you know, can you use these preclinical models to um, uh, start to uh, investigate the, the um, um, optimization of, of, the, of both arms of the treatment. Um, and again, they, they, they repeat that. So the first is in cell lines, and then they repeat it again in a nice mass model showing that... Um, if you add, you know, in this, uh, in panel C there, that the five and the 10 gray are equally effective um, in combination with the trastuzumab. 
And the, then the sort of last paper in this, you know, just with the HER2 targeting, I just uh, spent looked at, and I think again this brings up a couple of interesting points to think about, uh, but also highlights a problem with some of these studies. So this isn't the first time this has been reported, but the, uh, but here they show it sort of quite nicely, uh, showing that actually radiotherapy in itself can increase the um, levels of HER2 expression. Um, and on the left, in these MCF7 cell lines, this is a, the C6 line is an MCF7 that was um, grown out of mice that um, uh, was resistant, you know, the, the remaining cells that were resistant to the radiotherapy, and you can see they've got higher HER2 levels. And then on the right, with the 41, this is a mouse breast cancer, mammary um, uh, carcinoma cell line, um, these are, this is the expression of the HER2 in the mouse uh, tumor cells, um, you know, in the tumors, and you can see that there's, uh, again, actually quite a striking upregulation of the, of the HER2. So that's, you know, just one thing to consider in these combinations. So they also um, then isolated these 41 cells from these tumors, and they're going to use this cell line later, so I've just sort of illustrated it here. So they've isolated a mouse mammary cal uh, um, cell line that's permanently upregulated its HER2. Um, what I thought was, again, it's, the other people had, they showed it very nicely in this paper, um, was that there's a, quite a lot of HER2, uh, no, this isn't amplification, just more expression often in the recurrent tumors and in the metastatic disease. And I think this comes back to, you know, who should be targeted, who should be, uh, which patients should be used for these combination treatments. And, you know, of course, we don't, um, we, we always refer back, refer back to the primary tumour because we don't biopsy the metastatic sites very often. So are there more patients with advanced disease who might benefit from some of these combinations? So they showed this very nicely, and this is just some illustrations, but they looked at some larger data sets. Um, and the main part of this paper was to say that when you get HER2 upregulation, you also get upregulation of another cell surface receptor called uh, CD47. And again, this was quantified in um, a, a larger a group of patients. So what's CD47? Uh, so CD47 is a cell surface receptor, and uh, no, it's upregulated on the tumor cells, but it binds to a receptor on macrophages. And what that does is inhibits macrophage phagocytosis. So, mag you know, macrophage phagocytosis is, you know, how many of the cells are, uh, um, uh, 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 tumor cells are dying, uh, 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 are taken up and eaten up by the macrophages. So, it's been termed a sort of myeloid-specific immune checkpoint protein. And the question they asked um, um, is that if you block, so it's, if you, um, so normally the CD47 is blocking the phagocytosis. If you put a blocking antibody against it, then you, this is a, a graph of increased phagocytosis. Um, there's no difference if you also add in the trastuzumab. So this is just proving that the CD47 is involved in, in mediating phagocytosis. Um, so then they did um, this um, you know, nice um, animal experiment. So they put the 41... Uh, tumors in these mice. These are the ones that I showed you earlier that now are HER2 positive. And they do all these different combinations. So you've got, um, um, I've got, well, except they don't have no treatment, but they've got radiotherapy on its own, radiotherapy with a control antibody. You see there's an effect of um, adding in this CD47 antibody, um, the, the pink line there and the green line. Um, sorry, the green line and the uh, radiotherapy with the trastuzumab, and then the triple uh, combination where you're really getting very good tumor control. So, you know, this, when, when I was looking at this, I thought this is very exciting. You know, this is, you know, m maybe improve this combination. But there is a big problem with this. They're using... Um, uh, mouse tumors in a fully immunocompetent animal. And in, what was curious was how they gave the trastuzumab, which is that they injected it intratumorally rather than intravenously. Um, 
and uh, again, they gave, they gave quite a lot of doses, uh, two doses of radiotherapy, but you can see the red lines when they're treating with the trastuzumab. And the problem is, um, and I looked, is that trastuzumab, although it's been used in these models and people have drawn all sorts of conclusions from it, it doesn't actually bind mouse HER2 or rat HER2 for that matter. So the effects that are being seen here are not to do with blocking HER2. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're all about putting um, a humanized antibody intratumally into a mouse, which has got a, a, an immune system, and that's just triggering um, uh, some immune-related um, killing in these models. So, um, th um, you know, and they're not, and I, I don't mean to diss these people, because there's been lots and lots of other people papers where people have put trastuzumab into mouse models and, and, and shown effects. Um, to finally, on the HER2, um, there is now some, you know, some nice preclinical data coming in comparing her, uh, trastuzumab and the TDM1, and of course what one would want is the, um, the next generation of ADCs. I won't say anything about the PARPs because I can see time's up and there wasn't much to say. So I'm just going to go to my conclusions. <laughs> well, in, in the, you know, I think there are new... Anyway, uh, I'll get to my conclusions. So, you know, it's, it's, it was an education to me to just realise how little there was out there. So what, what can the preclinical pre studies doing? I think there is a, a, an opportunity to ask some of these questions about the sequencing, um, obviously to test new reagents when they come in. I think everyone's been talking about this. Can we use these models to sort of get better biomarkers for, um, uh, for response? Um, it, I think in, you know, when I was looking at the POP literature, um, certainly there's a, a, an opportunity, um, you know, for, 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 for study, you know, the mechanisms of the, of the toxicity. And, um, of course, if you do work in the immune-competent syngenetic models, then increasingly with immunotherapy, we want to know the role of the immune system. So I just want to say thanks and apologies if anyone <laughs> here was author of any of these papers that I've massacred for you. Um, and um, that's it for me. <laughs>